Welcome back, Canaanites. With October wrapping up, we got another issue of Inside Infinite. With the recent campaign overview video releasing on Monday, this issue is naturally about characters and the UXI, or user experience and user interface. This latest issue was massive, as it often dove into the nitty-gritty details that go into how certain systems and decisions come about. I may gloss over some of this, but the work that goes into game design is no simple matter. So then, let's dive in. Starting things out, we're introduced to members of the character team. Steve Dick, character and combat director, Brian Repka, character art lead, Juan Carlos Laria, animation lead for the character team, and Nick Avalone, senior animator for the team. As per usual, the team starts by laying out their creative goals slash pillars. The first up is creating compelling AI combatants, which doesn't just refer to an AI's combat ability, but their aesthetic as well. The goal with this pillar is to ensure that each AI has a clear role and purpose within a given setting, i.e. why there is a pack of grunts here instead of a couple elites or something, as a random example. It also encouraged the team to embrace sci-fi, to quote the article, meaning that they were encouraged to try new ideas with all the different species they have available, something not all shooters can do. The second pillar is player comprehension. Again, dealing with both gameplay and aesthetics, the idea is to ensure that players understand who and what they're fighting. This is achieved with a combination of art, animation, design choices, and behavior. And a key part of this is, of course, player feedback, or how the AI react to a player's actions. From there, the team dives into the process of bringing back more legacy designs, something I think you see clearest in the new Elite design, and the Return of the Brutes. For returning species, grunts, jackals, and elites primarily, the team used the spiritual reboot nature of Infinite as an excuse to bring back more legacy-inspired designs. Of course, these aren't simply old designs with a new coat of paint, but entirely new designs that evoke the classic aesthetics so many people love. For the Brutes, however, the article gives us a lot of additional detail about the process that went into bringing the Brutes back. The team wanted to make them fun, aggressive enemies, but ensure they weren't simply dumb space monkeys. They also had to be differentiated from elites, an issue the franchise has wrestled with since their introduction. While elites might be more tactful and peel away from combat for some cover, brutes will likely charge straight at the player. One of the cool new features 343 invested in for these brutes was more customizable armor. To achieve this, they designed a full-body tech suit with tons of attachment points for various types of armor, armor which could be shot off. However, 343 didn't just apply this to the brutes. All characters were built in a modular fashion, allowing for a lot of variety among the species and even within specific ranks. For example, the article informs us that brute miners will sport a variety of looks. Some will be fully armored while others might have very little. So, in essence, it might almost be like the Halo 2 brutes fighting alongside Halo 3 or Halo Reach-like brutes. And that, I think, is a great segue into a topic I've been curious about since the July 2020 demo the presence of banished soldiers in traditionally colored armor. If we're fighting the banished, why do some brutes have turquoise armor and some elites are sporting classic minor blue? I suspected at the time that this was to break up what would otherwise be a sea of banished red and silver, which seems to be one of the prime motivations. The other is, of course, legacy. The colored armor sets denoting rank are an iconic part of the franchise. Though motivated by gameplay, I do hope we get an in-universe explanation for this. Maybe those who aren't in Banished Colors are recent conscripts or something, or maybe the lowest ranks within the Banished use the older armor designs or something. Again, I just hope it's addressed. I'm curious if units in full Banished Regalia will be any different or any tougher than traditionally colored enemies. Speaking of, the article includes a render of the new Grunts comparing a Miner with an Ultra. In addition to having a full face covering and an improved Methane pack, the Ultras also have additional armor, a cool addition I really dig. From there, the article gets into some of the newer enemy units, starting with the Grunt Mule. We know this Grunt enemy type will carry a weapon rack on its back, one that can be used by both players and enemies, but it seems that these mules will also be scavenging the battlefield for weapons and grenades. I'm curious how they'll react to being stuck on the weapon rack, like if they'll try to get it off before the grenade explodes or something. A new unit we got to see in July last year was the Brute Berserker, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. Like everything else in the game, they received a graphical overhaul in the past year and look absolutely fantastic. 
Craig has evolved into Greg, and damn does he look good. Next up, let's talk about the Spartan Killers, which seems to be a more player-friendly term for the Hand of Atriox. Seems being the operative word, since there's a lot we don't know. It's entirely possible, too, that not all Spartan Killers are members of the Hand of Atriox. Anyway, though, this Spartan Killer class of enemy was born out of a desire to include more bosses and mini-bosses in Halo, and it seems that their black with hints of red color scheme was inspired by the A-Team van. If only they had their own ride. We get two example renders in this article. One is of Jega Erdamnai, who looks like a perfect recreation of his concept art. Although, I wish he had remained left-handed. Where's the lefty love, 343? The other Spartan killer we get is Tovaris, another character we received concept art for. I'll admit, I was hoping the in-game model would have at least a little more of a redhead, but at least the smug, disinterested look on his face is pretty great. Tavares is shown carrying a scrap cannon here, which I'm really looking forward to using. The last of our new enemies in this article are the Skimmers. Though shown to be flying around in the recent campaign overview, it seems that they are considered ground units, using their wing-like pods to hover across the ground. We don't get too much detail naturally, but they are described as a mid-tier combatant, like a higher-ranked grunt or jackal, and they can provide challenges to players both on foot and in vehicles. We'll be talking a bit more about these guys in a future video. Before we move on to the UX UI team, let's take a look at a couple additional character renders included in today's article. First, we have a pair of Marines showing off their new design and armor in all their glory, and damn do they look good. You can see the modularity 343 mentioned at work, with each Marine having some slight differences between them. Lastly, we have the pilot, this time holding a helmet reminiscent of the Halo 3 Marine helmet. You can really see all the detail in his flight suit here. And if you've seen Late Night Gaming's breakdown of the campaign overview, I have to agree with him on something. I had no idea the chess piece the pilot was wearing was meant to be metal until the campaign overview video. Halo Infinite is really looking fantastic now. And speaking of looking great, another discipline vital for the player experience is the user experience and user interface team at 343, whose work touches several corners of the game. This is everything from the more upfront HUD to fictional detailing and even the customization experience. For this issue, we're joined by a colossal eight people. There's Vincent Hui, UX design lead, Chad Mirshak, UI art lead, Paige Johnson, a lead on both production for UX UI and accessibility, Eric Diaz, realization lead, Omer Jonas, senior visual designer, Roxy Garza, senior creative technologist, Casey Donaldson, senior technical UX designer, and Ian Soderdalen, who has been helping coordinate the UX UI team deliver its designs, UI art, and code. If I butchered any of those names, I am sincerely sorry. With those introductions though, let's move on to those central pillars. First up is empower our users with inviting, engaging, and intelligible interactions. A bit more wordy, but pretty straightforward. Make sure players can engage with the UX UI elements with ease and understanding. The second is a more familiar one in many ways, modern legacy. Embrace the tradition while refining the experience, but don't change for the sake of change. It should be recognizable as a part of Halo's legacy, but stand out on its own merits. From there then, the article dives into various aspects of Halo Infinite's UI and user experience. And there's really no better place to start than the HUD. I'm sure many have had questions about Halo Infinite's HUD choices, and luckily, we get a lot of answers here. For Infinite, 343 threw out a lot of the additional detail and toned things down a bit. Not a full return to older Halo HUDs, but a middle ground between stuff like Halo 3 and Halo 4. They also moved the weapon, grenade, and ability boxes into a single corner of the HUD. According to the article, this in particular was done to reduce eye fatigue and cognitive load, supposedly also being a cause of Halo 5's sweatiness. This last bit I find a little odd, since Halo has always had its HUD elements strewn about the screen. That said, TV sizes have grown quite a bit in even the last decade, let alone the last 20 years, so there might actually be some merits to this claim. Halo 4's HUD design will always be my personal favorite, striking a perfect balance between complex and unintrusive, but the Halo Infinite HUD is a close second in a lot of ways. Now, the way the HUD is used in campaign is often different from multiplayer. In multiplayer, a HUD is there to quickly relay vital information to the player without being obtrusive. 
In Campaign, it's an additional tool for storytelling, engagement, and immersion. One major way Halo Infinite is doing all that is through the new Visor OS. The development of Visor OS was born from earlier work that started with the Assault Rifle's digital display. As more UI elements were designed, certain patterns emerged, and eventually, the team began fleshing out design language and elements for the Visor system, turning it from the rather simple Visor setup from previous games into its own operating system and storytelling channel. Visor OS has two primary elements, the traditional blue front-end elements, the equivalent of the familiar Windows OS, and the neon green elements almost like a DOS screen. So you interact with the blue elements, such as those in the menus, and see the DOS-like green text when upgrades are being applied. As development went on, the team refined what the front-end elements would be, eventually settling on the five that we saw in the recent campaign overview. TAC map, the mission map and place where players can find and track objectives and plan their approach. This was developed in collaboration with Skybox Labs, an independent development studio that works with Microsoft Studios. Upgrades, pretty self-explanatory. FOB, which does indeed keep track of the forward operating bases that the Chief liberates and what support items are available from them. Targets, indeed a series of dossiers on high-value targets to take down. And Database, quote, a compendium of narrative logs and collectibles found across the world of Zeta Halo. These are the first solid details we've had on the database, and as many suspected, it is closely tied to the collectibles we'll be able to find in the campaign. Hopefully at least some of these collectibles are related to codex-style entries. I've said it before and I'll say it again, Halo really needs an in-game codex. That aside, the work that goes into these five simple tabs is astounding. The team discusses how, with the TAC map for example, they had to strike this delicate balance between the map being detailed without being too cluttered, balancing the need to give locations and informations with the struggle of avoiding clutter, and above all, the system needs to be stable, responsive, and quick. It's an insane balancing act between what can sometimes be disparate ideas, so I really have to tip my hat, so to speak, to 343 and a lot of other developers out there. Before we move on, I did want to take another quick look at the TAC map, specifically the new image 343 provided with this update. I hadn't realized before that this particular symbol was, seemingly, for those currently mysterious ring structures that make up part of Halo Infinite's iconography. What they do remains unknown, but it seems that they will have some role to play. In general on this map, we can see a lot of side objectives that weren't visible in the campaign overview. I wonder if they were deliberately hidden, or if you might be able to find intel at certain locations that reveals the locations of other collectibles. Hopefully that makes sense. Getting back to the icons themselves, we see the familiar Ransom Keep mission from the overview, a raid on a banished tower, then some new red icon that I'm not too sure about. Maybe it's a banished structure the Chief has to eliminate, maybe it's something related to Harbinger, I couldn't say. Around the area we can see the UNSC symbol a couple of times, plus what kind of looks like a UNSC medal. Maybe those are rescue missions. One thing I think is rather obvious by comparison are these target icons, almost certainly identifying assassination targets. From there though, the article shifts over to discussing UX and UI development for customization. The article dives into a lot of details surrounding these systems, from how these ideas were developed and fleshed out, to the challenges of implementation. Concepts we generally take for granted turn out to be major challenges to overcome. As an example, just getting the menu's previews of customization items like the helmet to change color depending on what armor coating you have equipped was more complicated than one might imagine. Instead of simply using a pre-rendered image of each armor piece, like we saw in the original MCC, the preview images in Infinite are real 3D renders of these objects. The team also discusses how they were tuning the user experience to implement a feature called deep linking. In essence, if you see a customization item you want, the game will tell you not only how to unlock that item, but basically link the player to where in the game to get that item. So if you see a cool shoulder piece from the battle pass, the deep linking can direct the player to the item within the battle pass. It's a simple idea on paper, though one I have no doubt that is far from simple to develop and implement. After spending a brief bit of time on the development of some of the menu items, like the vehicle and weapon bench preview screens and how they too were built around ideas of immersing the player, the discussion moves over to the manufacturer's logos that we see throughout the menus. I touched on these a bit in part one of my lore and easter eggs from the Halo Infinite tech preview. 
Showing off all these different manufacturers required re-examining the logos of each, essentially bringing them all through a minor rebranding to simplify the logo and clean up its presentation to make them more easily identifiable at a glance and at small scale. In this regard, 343 did a banger of a job. And of course, they worked closely with the Transmedia team to ensure they were keeping things canon. There's not much else to say on the matter at the moment, but for anyone curious, here are several of the logos 343 have already revealed. Materials Group, Chalab's Defense Solutions, Imbrium Machine Complex, Beweglichkeit's Rüstungssystem, The Watershed Division, a part of Oni, RKD Group, Ushuaia Armory, Vakara Geshem BH, I'm guessing Fotis, Hannibal Weapon Systems, Emerson Technical Systems, Cascade Stronghold Technologies, Misria Armory, Sinoviet Heavy Machinery, Lethbridge Industrial, Korolev Heavy Industries, Optican, Fractures, and Fractures Tenrai. Of course, the iconographic detail doesn't stop with manufacturers. It's never been uncommon for Halo's weaponry to be a canvas of information and decals, and that's just as true for Infinite, if not more so. Chad Mirshak specifically notes that the team basically went through a branding process for each weapon, resulting in individual logos that reflect the personality of each weapon. He adds that he would also love to see these on t-shirts, and I can't help but agree. I would love to see a t-shirt with all these decal details. Speaking of though, the blog provides four decal breakdown images, starting with the MA-40. We can see here the level of detail that went into pretty much every aspect of this weapon. I'm no gun enthusiast, let alone an expert, so I'll likely miss a lot of details that might be interesting, but the stuff that stood out to me here was first the one click equals one half MOA on the display attachment, and secondly, the EVOS-J labeling on said attachment. The MA-37 had the EVOS-D printed on its display, thanks to CIA-391 for that one. We can also see that the AR has two firing modes, full auto and what appears to be a burst fire semi-auto mode, if I'm reading this correctly. Moving over to the Bulldog, what I found most interesting was the Soulcore logo on it. Some of you may recall from my overview of MCC Season 8, but the Soulcore was Bungie's original name for the UNSC. It seems that the Soul Corps did exist to some extent in the official canon, though details obviously remain sparse. Maybe it was the original name for humanity's space force before the UNSC rose to power during the Interplanetary War, or something. Regardless, it's cool to see the Soul Corps return once more, and I hope we get some details on it in the future. The Hydra has a swath of cool details, such as an IFF interrogator or the how to operate instructions. Though what really stood out to me was the decal reading, URNA Seattle Complex. The URNA is the United Republic of North America, a political alliance born from Canada, Mexico, and the political remnants of the United States. The decal indicates that the Hydra came from Earth originally. Either its manufacturing predates the created, or the UNSC was somehow able to extract a lot of firepower from Earth, which could very well be the most heavily guarded location under Cortana's control. Lastly, we have the VK-78 Commando. Being a German-made product, its caliber decal reads KAL rather than CAL. The Commando also appears to have a semi-auto firing mode, though in-game it's fully automatic. Following these individual weapon decal breakdowns, we also got a look at several of the other weapon logos for human weapons, and damn, do they look great. From there, the article dives a bit into the work the UXUI team has done for accessibility options. These range from the color choices for player outlines, to text size options, to the various inputs for sensory settings, i.e. visuals, auditory, and even touch. This is where options for turning certain features up or down and intensity arose from, as part of feedback around concerns of motion sickness and other discomfort. Not a lot of time is spent on the subject, but it seems that Xbox Wire dove into a lot of these accessibility options at the start of the month. In short, 343 have added a lot of features to make the game welcoming to far more people than ever before. The article begins to wrap up at this point, diving into a preview of what the UX UI team will be doing post-launch. Vincent Hui specifically notes that they've heard the desire for additional player outline settings, which is good news in my book. Hopefully they'll be able to separate the options for player outlines and shield colors. Most of the other comments are about listening to feedback and developing new experiences, and ways to leverage the UX UI aspects of the game beyond their traditional purposes. 
And wrapping up this part of the article, the team shares their thanks with the community and their excitement for fans to finally get their hands on the game. As always, Inside Infinite wraps with Tales from the Trenches, followed by some words from Joe Staten. Josh Lindquist, Principal Software Engineer Lead, shares a particularly hilarious story of AI uprisings in Teams chat. Tashi shares some wonderful news that tickets for Halo Infinite's first HCS event sold out like hotcakes. And finally, Josh Nosko, a live broadcast producer, shares the story of how the infamous Warthog Cliff scene made it into the campaign overview. Definitely give these all a read, and again, I apologized if I butchered anyone's names. Much of Joe's final word from here is about how the raid on Random Keep shows off the philosophy of Halo Infinite. There isn't just one way to approach this target, but several avenues for the player to explore. To quote directly, Halo Infinite is a game that always does its best to say yes to you and the choices you want to make, no matter what that choice is. And that's a wrap for this latest issue of Inside Infinite. Sorry for the wait, I had some existing plans on Friday, so I haven't been able to work on this as quickly as I might have otherwise liked. Still, I hope you enjoyed this latest issue of Inside Infinite as we approach the final month before launch. Did anything about this issue stick out to you or excite you? Let me know in the comments below. Stick around for the Patreon shoutout. Thank you all for watching as always, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. First, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Horospis patrons. First, there's Hope. Then we have Freight. Discombobulated Sycophant. Justin Montgomery. Ada Frame. Man in the Dark. Keisha Dila. Daddy Anarchy, Great Scott Productions, and finally, Jumpy Sucks Balls. Thank you all for your amazing support of the channel. Next, I'd like to thank our theoretical patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or get a direct shout out, check out patreon.com slash halocanon. You can simply support the channel or get additional benefits such as behind the scenes materials, including raw audio for upcoming videos, or even shout outs like this. All patrons now get early access to certain videos as well, and more benefits are to come. However, your continued viewership is more than enough for me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, and maybe even subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. If you really enjoy this, turn on that notification bell so you can be among the first to see new videos when they release. But for all my fellow Canaanites, keep on being awesome.